The federal and state governments seem to be in a conflict situation as regards to the construction of roads and its financing. And the voice of many Nigerians have been heeded to as the sponsor of the controversial hate speech bill has bowed to pressure. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cohn. It seems Nigerian roads have gone beyond causing accidents and indications have revealed that the federal government and states are heading to a fresh battle over the delay in refunding the money spent by state governments on federal roads. Now, joining me to have this conversation, I have Dami Adebayo. Uh, he is a political analyst. It's good to have you join us. Hiya. Good to see you again. Okay. And Francis Chilaka is also a political analyst. It's good to have you join us, Francis. I I'm going to do a throwback to... 2008, 2009, when Akbabio spoke on the issue of federal and state roads. Now, we know him as then the uncommon transformation governor. And he did say something about the fact that federal governments should allow states handle the reconstruction of state, uh, federal roads because for him, he thought that the federal government was not doing a good job at it. And almost 10 years down the line, we're here again, states and federal government locking horns. I'll start with you, Francis. Why do you think it's such a difficult thing for the federal government to fix federal roads when monies are allocated for every year in the budget for these federal highways? Um, well, it's easy for us to sit down here and um, chastise the federal government. But we know that um, um, if you look at the road network in Nigeria, the federal government has only 15% of all the roads in Nigeria. The state government has 18%, while the local government has 67%. So with this statistics, you, 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 it's obvious to know where we should really start from. Hmm. Yes, federal roads, we need them badly. But you see, over time too, um, some state governors in the past, in, you know, in recent past, have said, we are fixing these roads. And then I'm asking, if they are fixing these roads, why is it that these roads cannot be used? It, it simply means that something is wrong somewhere. Somebody is not doing what he's supposed to do. So asking, for me, I would say, look, everybody should be conscious of what they are, the responsibility they've been given to. So should the federal government not be conscious of what they've been given to? Because you, you made it seem at, in your opening that what the federal government has as a job when it comes to reconstruction is very meager compared to what the states have. Why is it taking them forever? And we see them use these as campaign tools to say, oh, East West Road will be fixed and then we'll chair. I mean. But you know, before now, there was an agreement between the state and the federal where the state governors were asked to fix these roads and then come back for reimbursement. The question is, if a state governor comes and says, federal government is owing me 25 billion for roads, which presumably was fixed, and the road is not used, is not motorable right now, who do you hold responsible? Cattle calling pot black. But if the federal government did its job, would the states have to wade into the matter in the first instance? There was a lacuna that they created, meaning that they are unable to do their jobs. And the states are saying, okay, let's help you. And then whether they do the job or not, no, my still is, their fault. My the box simple. still stops at yes, the table of the federal simple. government. My take is simple. You know, the, 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 the way we're going right now in this country, a lot of ministries need to be scrapped. What does that mean? How does that suffice in this conversation? Yes. You see, every year, the budget has, you know, have figures put out for Federal Roads Ministry of Works. Now, scrap this ministry. The National Assembly should wake up to their responsibility of a side function. Send this money to the state governors and ensure that they do the job. Because, you see, what we're having is... These same state governors that have No, no, not see, this is where we're having the problem. The problem we're having is that you have a minister who sits on a budget. You have a state government who sits on a budget. And everybody's waiting who will spend first. And that's why the roads are not working. So it's either we bring back the road agency as it used to be, let them become more active in the system, get the people involved. You see, I keep saying, until you get the people to own the roads, 
the roads will not work. You don't go and bring a contractor to come and control, construct a road. Nobody knows their office. Nobody has relationship with them. Nothing. They just come one day, you see tractors, the next day the tractors disappear. So the state, the people in the state must know who these contractors are, where their offices are, so that if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, you hold them accountable. The problem we have is that nobody is being held accountable in this country. Interesting. Uh, Dami, uh, <laughs> so a lot of states are being old right now. A quiet woman is old about um, 78 billion naira, which is really outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, Sakoto is old 16.8 billion naira. I have never been to Sakoto. I don't know what the highway around <laughs> yeah. there looks like. Um, and several other states. I would speak about a highway that I know of since yeah. I was a child. I have not known the Kalabaitu Road to be a good road, okay. yeah. especially when you get to the Cross River part of it. Okay. Literally, it is a death trap as we speak. Yeah. And all of these monies are being you know, banded around. What do you think? I mean, Francis has said his piece. What do you think is the problem? Why is it that these roads are perpetually bad? Um, I think the issue is partly because of the way the, com um, the country is structured as well. The fact that you have, you know, an oversight, a federal government in Abuja that essentially disposes and executes contracts as well, that doesn't have as much ground or as much understanding of the local terrain as the state governments and even the local governments will as well. Um, but my major growth with federal government roads as well isn't just the fact that, you know, um, there isn't enough money to spend on them. It's the fact that the federal government's unwillingness to relinquish parts of its power, especially when it's failing, is usually, you know, where we, can, we come to have this argument as well. If we remember, this, um, having states do the roads and the reimbursements, was a compromised position as well. The general argument then was for it to be fully handed over to states. States that could handle these roads should take these roads as well. I mean, there are times where we had states that had major booms in their economy. We had a quiet bomb as well. But it was doing major infrastructure as well. And these states could have afforded to take these things on as well. But the fact that the government decided to keep holding on to it and do the reimbursement option as well, not getting involved in the tendering process as well. So again, if we're going to argue that there's no accountability as well, there's no accountability even from the federal government as well. So if we are worried... But the federal road, government is saying, uh, they, they say, look, for those of you who say we're owing you, there has to be a verification process of sorts. Come and we will do the verification and right after that mm -hmm. we will pay. But then the Aquabum State Government is saying, I accept responsibility. You know, <laughs> I mean, so specifically, it's yeah. a you versus us thing. And like I asked Francis, if federal government did its job, because again, the percentage of work that they have to do when mm -hmm. it comes to these road construction is meager compared mm -hmm. to state. Why is it such a big deal? And you have a federal ministry who is saddled with this responsibility. And we keep seeing Julius Bezer or one of those things, mm -hmm. you know, right there on the highway. But Nothing ever happens. It's very unfortunate as well. And there's and the process for even refunds and reimbursements is very politicized as well. Same thing with the FAAC allocations as well. Um, I remember Kogi having, you know, ten billion naira disbursed in October on the eve of elections as well. So you could you could see you could see how, you know, inherently the system is set up to fail as well. Um, and you have very interesting states finding innovative ways to work around this as well. You have, you know, Ondwani Kitsi deciding to do an expressway um, between two major towns as well. But the fact still remains as well. The fact that they had to stay, seek federal government approval, the fact that they had to wait on it as well, makes the process cumbersome. So if the reimbursement process fails, then the roads are going back to an even worse state than we do um, have as well. Because there's one thing we're sure about. So the federal government cannot afford, you know, to fund capital expenditure the way it wants to. I, I, I keep asking. Federal government comes up with lofty ideas, you know. Um, I was listening to the president over the weekend talking about the fact that he cannot afford to have a Nigeria that is underdeveloped. And I'm wondering, how do you get development to get to every nook and cranny of a, of a country as big as Nigeria if the major mode of transportation, or rather the, the roads mm -hmm. where we all ply because we don't even have a good transportation system in this country, isn't working? Do they, I mean, I'm trying to understand, do they do the research that they need to do before they make these statements, well, or they're just statements that they yeah, make to make let, themselves let, let look me, good? Let me cut you to tell you the, the truth of what the problem is. is um, we need to be sincere to ourselves in this country, and that sincerity starts by looking at that document called the 1999 Constitution. Oh, here we go. Yes. Until we shred that document, this country cannot move forward. Sorry, did you say shred? Yes, we need to shred it. It's not people-oriented. Well, that, that it is not a people-oriented document. It is not, how, it how is not by the people. We know that how, is we, what we we we, that's we, what we're using right now, isn't it? We all it? know how that document came to be. 
And we all know the, the interest that were involved in the preparation of that document. We need to have a people-oriented document. We need to sit down as Nigerians, look at ourselves eyeballs to eyeballs and say, this is what we think is workable. How many people would agree with you that the Constitution, that they don't even have an idea? A lot of people idea. agree right now. Well, 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 those well, how many people even it? have an idea of what is in the Constitution should, to know if it's people-oriented or not? I mean, if you consider the fact that we've had two national conferences since we've had this Constitution. And nothing's well, been done and, with and, it? You know, and, and I mean, so, you know. Do we I, need I another think... one? And who's going to pay attention <laughs> to it? Why don't we implement the last one? The 79 Constitution. The last, um, the, 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 the one uh, by... Um, well, the, the government in power would say they were not part of it, so it makes it invalid. You see, you see so long as we personalise governance in this country, mm -hmm. we can move forward. You make some, somebody becomes a governor, he forgets that government is a continuum. Yeah, that's true. He begins to think of his own, you know, a governor wakes up from sleep and he says, I want to build 27 local, uh, 27 stadium in 27 local governments. And everybody's clapping their hands. Mm -hmm. Another governor wakes up tomorrow. He says, "No, this part of this state is not in the developmental plan. Who decides what should be? It's not about what the people in government want. It's about what we, the people, want. And are we? They should and, allow us. And are we vocalizing it? Well enough, are we putting it at the tables of these people? Well, or, well, or do we just murmur <laughs> and complain about it? You know, in recent times now, we're, we're gradually, gradually, people have started speaking out, and then a senator you wakes see, up and is We never get a straightforward everybody. answer when I ask this question. Oh, yes, you know, we, some of us are. I, I don't know if we're really uh, ready I, for I think, I what we're the, asking for. I, if we even I, are asking for it the right way. I think the simple answer is no. And, you know, obviously we've only just come into an age and which looks like it's regressing as well, of where votes are starting to count as well. So, you know, we've not truly been represented by the people that we think or that the people that we've selected as a people as well. And as long as that doesn't happen or the strength of that doesn't happen, then we're going to continue um, having these discussions as well. So at the crux of it is having a fair electoral system that allows us to send our representatives, and even at that, to hold them accountable as well. Um, the, you're speaking rightly about the 99 constitution, that's not people-oriented, and it's a fault as well. But I think the crux of the matter is whatever constitution that we do pick as well is going to require us to hold elections. And if we're going to have elections that are as farcical as the last two that we've just had for the Ubers as well, then there isn't a lot of hope for people to think that these processes would reflect any change as well. No, but, but if you're talking about, you see, to, 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 to work on this 1999 constitution, mm -hmm. it's a simple way. We suspend everything about the election in 2023 <laughs> until we have a new document. <laughs> see, I'm telling you the truth. I'm, see, I'm telling you the truth because the way things are going, nothing is moving forward. Is it the health sector? Is it the electricity sector? Is it the employment sector? Is it nothing is working? If we thirty thousand naira minimum wage has been dragging for how many if months? If we suspend the constitution, can it makes we, us a lawless society. Can we not even? What exactly? I mean, I'm asking this because we already have laws. We have a constitution, which mm -hmm. is a grand norm, and people are still flagrantly disobeying the law. Mm -hmm. Suspending the constitution. What do you think that will get us? A constitution that does not give room for referendum is not a constitution. That's the truth. But what is a country? See, what is a country I, I, without I, I don't, a I, guide I, or I, rules I, 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 I'm not against it. No, I'm saying, say what is a country without rules and regulations? Es ethnicity, tribalism, favoritism. This is the bane of our problem. If, you, if, if, if you've read through what's happening on the social media in the last few days regarding the um, MD of um, a piece, you'll be shocked. This is somebody Nigerians were praising few, not up to two months ago. And all of a sudden, people don't even understand that it is, these are charges. He has not been indicted. These are charges. Mm. And people are going, you know, Nigerians have gone gagas about it. People are taking sides. Oh, he's Igbo, he's this, he's that. It is wrong. We need to understand that Nigeria comes first. I believe in Nigeria. For me, I would always tell people, the problem we have is, you, as you see a Nigerian outside and you ask him, where are you from? He doesn't tell you I'm a Nigerian. He tells you I'm an Igbo man. It is wrong. Yeah. We need to remove that clause called state of origin and replace it with state of residence. It allows everybody to participate politically wherever they find themselves. Again, coming back to the, the issue of the 
road constructions, the federal mm -hmm. road constructions, because <laughs> whether we like it or not, <laughs> the Embermont is <laughs> the biggest of the Embermont. Yeah. People are going to be traveling, as we all know, mm -hmm. to their homes to celebrate with loved ones. And we know what happens. Some of these roads are death traps. Oh, yeah. How do we get the federal government to stop complaining and pointing fingers? and start getting to fixing these roads. Because sometimes we see them surface the road and then that's it. It goes back to being terrible. I mean, we see trailers falling on. I saw a terrible picture of an accident the other day on one of those terrible spots, either on the, um, I don't know if it was going to Abao or somewhere. It was really terrible. How do we stop this? Because it, sometimes it has to take someone dying and I, will, I really wouldn't want that to happen. So what do we do? to hold the government at the juggler to make sure that this is done? Um, I think, um, funny enough, we're, we're at this very interesting stage in our history where for the first time, non-oil revenue is, you know, for the first time in a long time, is eclipsing, you know, oil revenue as well. And you can see this with the government trying to raise more funds and they're looking to increase VAT and this as well. And I think it's time that we start telling them that there's no taxation without representation as well. You can't, you know, expect to take money out of people's pockets and not do, um, not enforce or execute projects um, that are critical to the way they live as well. Um, unfortunately, I do not see um, the leaders for this kind of movement or for this kind of protest as well. The opposition is basically decimated. Civil society is compromised. So um, it's it's going to it's going to be a very interesting, you know, turn of events as well. Um, but ironically, I feel the government turning up the heat as well. They've decided not to be magnanimous in victory, and they've decided to um, flaunt it in our faces as well. They've decided to arrest journalists. They've decided to introduce draconian laws. And, you know, something has to give as well. The simple answer to your question is, you know, I don't know. <laughs> wow. But um, once again, as well, it's the fact that um, I think the power actually still lies with us as well. Um, in as much... Do we know that? Well... I think we have an idea. Are we ready to enforce it and to do the hard work that it needs is probably a different issue that needs discussing as well. But um, I think it's time that, you know, your taxation without representation becomes the mantra. Well, you're civil society. <laughs> and I always ask if we really do have civil society in Nigeria because... We, we used to have. Because we only hear you guys when it has to do with politics. What about people oriented programs or, or the fact that we... We have no representation, as he said. We are our own governments. We, produce, we provide our own water. We, have our, we provide our own lights. In fact, we, people have started where I live. We've graded our roads because they're <laughs> terrible. We've been abandoned. So why should I want to? I'm not saying don't pay taxes, but what is the need for Why do we have a government if they're not delivering the dividends of governance or good governance? First question. You're asking a question, but I'm going to throw a question at you. I, I do the Did question you, okay, here. Okay. <laughs> no, no, this so-called leaders, ask all the how questions. many of us elected them? Are you talking about voter turnout or Don't forget voter that a lot of people you have in the National Assembly. Whether we, voted for, you, whether we of, voted for you or not, you're now let, the let me, president no, 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 or the governor no. of all of the people, not just your political party. So it is your responsibility. You, see, you, see, you took a so note and you have to do your okay. job. So my uh, question is, civil society, in other parts of the world, civil society coughs or sneezes, the government catches cold. In Nigeria, the reverse is the case. What now, is the problem? Now, the problem is simple. Our politics is monetized. And it's a big problem. Somebody wants to go to the House of Rep to represent the people. Most times he has to sell his houses, if he has, sell his lands, and gives pittance to these same people he's going to represent. When he gets into power, the first thing he does is to recoup his money back. He doesn't care because he knows he has spent all his money getting there. So when you talk about civil society, the people must begin to realize that power belongs to them. Sovereignty belongs to the people. You don't need to take one letter from anybody to vote that person. It's a conscious thing that we all must imbibe in us. When we begin to do that, you will see you can hold somebody accountable. If somebody goes into an office, he contests an election, free and fair, and he wins. And he knows that these people came out to vote for me. The people will hold him accountable. But the system you have today makes it difficult for you to hold anybody accountable. <laughs> but that system needs to change. I am going to call on Mr. President. They need to look at the electoral laws again. They need to sit down 
if they are sincere about this country... Well, there's one on his table. We're waiting well, for him to yeah, get his signature. If, if they are sincere about this country remaining the way it is, remaining as a better country, like he said, a developing country or a developed country, he needs to look at the electoral laws again. He needs to work with the National Assembly to give us an electoral law that makes... That sets, first of all, it sets a, a limit to expenditure on budget on, on election. And people must push people but, but it's just, that are, it, are their own people. But is it the, just about the presidency? Because political no. parties come up with this outrageous amount. And then we don't have room in our constitution for independence because a lot of people would trash those parties and go do their thing on their own because they know they have what to offer. And the people who feel that they have something to offer would vote for them. But we don't have That's all what of I'm that. Saying. If we have an electoral law that takes care of all of that, what has been sitting on the president's table? All he needs to do is add the things to things that are necessary that will make Nigeria great. The greatness of, of Nigeria starts from the electionary process. If we don't get the electionary pro process right, this country will not move forward. Demi? I, I think I'd also argue as well that civil society, to be fair to them, have been at their most effective when the have they when the enemy is clear. You Can know? I have names? So, so when so when I, we, I would like to know. So, who so they when are. we so when we talk about this, when we talk about civil Demi, society, please, you when we talk about civil society, shows. when we talk about civil society during the military regime, it was pretty clear to see where they stood okay, well, as we're well. In a democracy. Uh, Following on as well, the four price hikes, the 2002 protests, 2003 protests, you had labor right up front as well. Even the Occupy Nigeria protests, you had labor in front as well. The issue for me isn't in as much monetizing, but it's the much the legitimacy they've lost as well. And the fact that there was a point where, you know, a certain chair of the NLC would call people out and people would come out and they would come and strike as well. Where's Co-opted into government. But that's but that again, but that's again as well, you know, shouldn't be uh, how do I explain it now? Shouldn't be the reason why we feel to listen to civil society as well. Um, but I think the Main. But how do you listen to... I'm so sorry. No problem. Go ahead, I'm, 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 it's your show. I took so, yeah. a course on this. I, I need to do due diligence. Yes. How do you trust whatever civil society says now? Because you know that one way or the other, these people have been bought over, unfortunately. So you see a protest oh. mm -hmm. for and you see a protest against and you can tell who's been bought by who. Mm -hmm. And so it, they, it has lost the power and you know, whatever footing it had. So well, people don't even me. believe whatever they're saying. Marianne, you belong to a union, the National Union of Journalists, yes? Yes, I what do. What does the National Union of Journalists stand Actually, on most I, issues? Actually, I belong to a towel. Well, again, where does it stand on most issues as well? Do you hold them to account? Do you elect your ex-goes? Do you feel like the people that stand there, do you feel like those people are representative of you? Are they of much course. older men that, you know, have acquired resources as well and do not have to fight as much yeah, well, for Well, not like the NUJ. <laughs> have they been talking about, you know, sexual harassment and things in the workplace? Because of if they're course. not relevant to contemporary issues as well, they wouldn't be relevant to me as well. Because if I feel, if I go for a civil society meeting and I go to this meeting and it is with middle-aged men who are comfortable, they have a house, they have a car, they're fine. I mean, I have a feeling that, you know, their future is set for them. At the bare minimum, they probably want something for their kids. So the fight is, I'm going to try as much as I can, but it's not do or die. That, you know, but for those of us that literally have no other country to go to as well. Because you have to be able to understand what I'm going through to be able to speak for me. That's my point uh, uh, as well. Mary, you need to also understand that um, the issue of unemployment is a big problem in Nigeria. We, we shouldn't throw that away. Of course. Now, a lot of people who are in this civil society are, as far as they are not employed. Wow. Yes, they are not. So everybody, like you see, Nigeria has become a country that has become too money conscious. So everybody is looking for money. How do I make get this money? A husband is looking for money. The wife is looking for money. The children are looking for money. Morality has been thrown to the dogs. You bring it back home. The churches are not even helping. Oh. The religious institutions are worse off. So everybody is just running in, you know, like headless chicken. The problem is, we need to come back to the fact where we begin to talk about morals in our homes, in our churches, in our mosques, in our schools. It starts from there. It's, 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 it's sad that Nigeria is a country where you don't even teach your so-called constitution in schools. Well, like, it's like you don't want people to well, know... His, history like, history been, has been brought back Yes, to well, it's like you don't want the people to know anything. You don't want people to... And unfortunately, 
It's sad, you know. I keep saying when Mr. President said a few years back that Nigerian youths are lazy, I still agree with him because a lot of our youths don't read. You see a lot of our youths on, on social media, they're not reading. People don't read. Uh, I think, I think. I are. disagree with no, you. No, no, I'm telling you, a lot of people, I, I, I'm I, deal, with, I deal with the young, <laughs> no, I deal with youth, youth so yeah. I know, they don't read. So, so can, can you say, I'm sorry, I want to sound a little politically correct, can you say some? I said some, I didn't say all, I said some. Because you said you agreed with Mr. President, that means that some, you agreed no, Some Nigerian youth don't read. Okay. But the truth is that when people, don't forget that education is the bane of development. A society that do not have educated people cannot develop. Really? Yes. What kind of education? Are we should, should, because you know sometimes we just brush over these things. Is oh, it really education. education, going to school education, or being aware of what's happening in your locality, knowing your rights? And, you I, know. I think for me that's where education starts where I'm from, um, and a perfect place as well. It's the fact that, you know, you understand that you live in a society and you do not live in a society by yourself, but you live in a society with other people. And that, you know, certain things that you do and that the community does impacts you and impacts them as well. Um, that for me is the basic bedrock of education as well. Now, that could be done at the primary level, but I think to the minimum, everyone should have tertiary level education as well. But now when you have a system where people that want to go to school can't go to school, they don't receive quality help, um, education as well, then, you know, we're going to come back into these issues as well. And we need to talk about the fact that the curriculum just isn't relevant as well. I mean, I have younger, I have younger siblings and I look at their work and I'm like, this has nothing to do with what you'd be doing in your life, nothing as well. So we've developed a school curriculum that one isn't even relevant, and then two, it doesn't work for anybody, not for the people learning it, not for the people teaching it, and not for the people that have to live with these people in society as well. So when we say education... So all you guys are saying <laughs> is that what we're having, this conversation we're having is not going to work until we have a total overhaul of the system. Essentially, yes. Restructure. <laughs> Restructure or bust. <laughs> Restructure, that's the only solution. Here we go. That's the answer, people. <laughs> anyway, I want to say thank you. Damia Debay, Francis Chilaka, both political analysts. They're not going anywhere. They're going to stay with us. We'll take a short break. And when we return, updates concerning the hate speech bill is next. <laughs>